Good afternoon. Welcome to Hendricks Chapel as we celebrate one of the most beloved and influential educators in the history of Syracuse University. Ralph Ketchum, a faithful and fruitful practitioner of the Maxwell approach to citizenship education. He joined the faculty here in 1951, and today, over six and a half decades later, this institution will never be the same. His professional accomplishments, of course, are countless. We will surely hear of some of them today. But of course, what many here will remember most were not simply what he did, but who he was. A man who let his life speak, and in doing so projected a way of being together that now spans across the globe. To all gather, on behalf of Syracuse University, we are honored to remember one of our finest here in this chapel. While such a man can never be replaced here at the heart of this campus, which he so dearly loved, we can surround each other with love and with compassion and grace. While no amount of words can summarize his decades of life and multitude of professional and personal contributions here, together we can express what he meant and will continue to mean in each and every one of our lives. While we cannot immediately take away the grief associated with his departure, here we can thank God for accompanying him and us far into the future. So thank you for being here. Let us pray. Gracious God, may all who gather this day receive your peace. May all who grieve in this moment receive your comforts, and may all who grasp for the fullness of this life trust in your promise. Remind us that you source and sustain us. This is our prayer, O oh God. We trust it is your desire. Amen. As requested by the family, a reading from Psalm 15. O oh Lord, who may abide in your tent, who may dwell on your holy hill? Those who walk blamelessly and do what is right and speak the truth from their heart, who do not slander with their tongue and who do no evil to their friends, nor take up a reproach against their neighbors, in whose eyes the wicked are despised, but who honor those who fear the Lord, who stand by their oath even to their hurts, who do not lend money at interest, do not take a bribe against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be moved. Our hymn printed in the program, we will sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Please take note, verses 1, 2, and 4.
Good afternoon. I'm David Bennett, Emeritus Professor of History, and it has been my honor to be asked by Julia Ketchum to take part in this celebration of a life of an extraordinary person. Ralph Ketchum was, as we all know, a brilliant and prolific scholar. He was a historian, he was a biographer, he was a political thinker whose many books gave him a truly national and international reputation. He was one of the great teachers of our time, an iconic figure in our classrooms who influenced the lives of generations of our students. And he was the quintessential Syracusan. He was um, a man who played a key role in the life of this campus, as the dean said earlier, for almost six decades. Ralph Ketchum was a central New Yorker. He was born in Ohio, but his father moved to Utica when he was three years old. He was raised there, he was educated there. He graduated just before the end of the Second World War in 1945, and so he went on to the Coast Guard Academy. He treasured his days at the Coast Guard Academy until very recently he had um, the Coast Guard Academy on the frame of his license plate. But, but after two years, the war long over, and he was not interested in really being an engineer. He transferred to a school where he could study the arts and sciences. He went to Allegheny College. He was a social studies and education major. His undergraduate alma mater would remember what a distinguished alum they had by granting him an honorary degree in future years. After Allegheny, he came back to upstate. He was two years at Colgate getting a Master of Arts in Teaching, and then he came here. He came to Maxwell. He came to a school which celebrates interdisciplinary studies because that's what he was interested in. Maxwell back in those days had a department of citizenship linked to an American studies undergraduate major and an American studies graduate program where people could get PhDs. Ralph was um, here and he found a strong mentor in the person who was chairing that department, Stuart Gary Brown, a major figure in the shaping of the American studies movement across America, a strong intellectual who became Ralph's mentor and he became his dissertation advisor. And Ralph chose as his dissertation a really big subject. And when it was finished, it was called The Mind of James Madison. Ralph was also interested in teaching and he had his very first experience in 1951 when he came here, teaching in the citizenship program. Back then, citizenship was a course that was required for everyone. Uh, and the Arts and Sciences program, and many other students on the campus took it as well. Responsible citizenship. It became Ralph's great passion, actually. And you know his last book was called Public Spirited Citizenship. That course started with the ancients, with the, um, with the, with the Greeks, and went through Hobbes and Locke right up to the present. Ralph enjoyed teaching in it, and he enjoyed teaching in the s s other course, the Citizenship 10, it was called, Problems in American Democracy for Sophomores and Upper Class Students, in which an interdisciplinary group of faculty would meet together in Maxwell Auditorium and debate historical and contemporary ideas, sometimes taking positions they didn't even share, so they could point out the complexity of these public questions. And then the students would meet in their individual sessions, and they would join the debate and write papers about it. It was a terrific course. It was the course more than anything else that probably inspired me. I was an undergraduate at that time in Syracuse and becoming a graduate student. And it was a very important course for Ralph. Years later, long after the citizenship department had disappeared, Ralph, as a senior faculty member in Maxwell, brought that course back as Public Affairs 320, he called it, Issues in American Democracy. And Ralph recruited faculty from across Maxwell, across arts and sciences, from, Ma from the management school it was called then, and, and from Newhouse to teach in it. Only Ralph could do that. But Ralph was finished with a big dissertation, and he was ready by 1956 to receive his degree, his PhD, his doctorate degree at Syracuse. 
And I had been an undergraduate here, and I was getting my undergraduate degree at that very time. And so I was sitting on the lawn in Archibald Stadium with my cap and gown, watching the doctoral students, as they always do, walk up to the stage to receive their degree. And there was this tall guy with his reddish hair sticking out behind the, behind the cap, not quite clashing with the orange um, hood that he had just been awarded for his doctoral degree. His dissertation was a really fine piece of work, and it just so happened at that time that at the University of Chicago, they had begun to edit the James Madison papers. And so he was asked to go out to Chicago to become the associate editor of the Madison papers. It turned out, actually, that I had chosen to go to graduate school, and I was going to Chicago. Maybe that wasn't an accident, because Stuart Brown was my my undergraduate advisor too, so I ended up out there. I got to see Ralph that first year. I hadn't known him all that well here because he'd been a graduate student and I had not. But he asked me during that first year, would you like to share an apartment with me? And so the next year, I found myself sharing this apartment with Ralph Ketchum. And then years later, when he'd won the case award, and somebody was writing it up for the case, or uh, it was a case publication. This writer called me and said, what was it like to room with Ralph Ketchum? And I said, well, it was like, it was like rooming with Jimmy Stewart. I mean, there was this tall, lanky guy, Im immensely kind, uh, with this wonderful temperament and brilliant. Now, we had slightly different um, Schedules. I'm an owl and Ralph's a lark. He gets up early and works early. And I go to work late and get up late. But I, I knew something about what he did in the morning, how he was always at his study. Sometimes he had to go over to campus, but he worked there, writing, reading. He had enormous discipline. I could see that even from the start. You know, you don't publish 12 books unless you are immensely disciplined. You, not only passion is not enough about your subject, you have to put out the work Ralph always did. But he traveled a lot back then because he was the editor of the papers and he would go south. And when he went south, he reconnected with this wonderful young woman that he had met long ago, years ago before on Silver Bay in Lake George in the eastern part of, uh, of New York State, Jefferson's most beautiful lake in America. They were at the Y camp together, and of course, they stayed in touch. And their romance flourished after Ralph was in Chicago, and they were married. And he brought Julia back to the apartment. Of course, I moved out. <laughs> but, but, but as it turns out, an apartment opened up right upstairs at the 14th floor. And so I saw a lot of the Ketchums. They were there for four years. They really loved the USC, and, and, and they liked Hyde Park, where it was located. But Ralph's true love was Syracuse, and Syracuse University, and the Maxwell School. And that's where he returned. He, he did go away briefly again for two years to Yale to become associate editor of the Franklin Papers. But he stayed here for those long six decades, although he did a good deal of, uh, of traveling from time to time. It was at Syracuse when he became a professor, ultimately, of political science and of history and public affairs and American studies, the true Maxwell interdisciplinary guy he was, that his publication record began. He started with his biography of Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, the political thought of Benjamin Franklin. Then in 1971, he published James Madison, a biography, 800 pages long, um, masterwork of original scholarship, republished again in 1991, still in print, the paperbacks at Barnes and Noble. It made him America's preeminent Madison scholar, and he still is. And a couple of years ago, when another book just came out on Madison, Gordon Willis, a well-known historian, reviewing it at the Times, ended by saying, this is the best single volume book we have on Madison, with the exception, of course, of Madison, James Madison, a biography by Ralph Lewis Ketchum. 
He, he, you know, every, I think almost every academic historian probably wants, and not Ralph, Ralph didn't care about things like this, but most of them want to have the big book, which makes their reputation. Ralph didn't write it because it was going to make his reputation, but it surely did. But he didn't stop with that. Then came from colony to country, the revolution in American thought, 1850 to 1920. And then soon after, a few years later, I actually, presence over party, the American presidency, 18, 1729 to 1829. And then um, his book on, 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 on the Constitution, framed, what was it called? F f f framed for, Frame for Posterity, what a wonderful title. Frame for Posterity, The Enduring Philosophy of the Constitution. Those five books were the two biographies or the corpus of his central work on, on uh, early American history. But he was interested in so many other things, interested in citizenship, interested in what he had learned when he traveled overseas and in Asia, and interested in how all of that interconnected with his work about the 18th century. And so he published several other works and before he did public spirited citizenship, he did individualism and public life, and he did the idea of democracy in the modern era. Nine important books, and then one other. And that had to do with Montpelier, because Madison, Madison's home had been in private hands, but finally the DuPont family had decided to give it to the National Historic Trust, and the old new wings were taken down, and it became just like it was back in those days, and Ralph became deeply involved in Montpelier. He gave his library there. He traveled there constantly. He was on the board at Montpelier, and he was the resident intellectual scholar, and he decided because Mount Pelier needed it, that he would write a book about the Madisons at Mount Pelier. That's what he called it, James and Dolly at Mount Pelier. So those were three, nine books he published, and then there were others, others that he edited, and textbooks as well, a dozen in all, a remarkable scholar. And his reputation was, um, was, was um, certainly secure. As a as a important figure in American historiography at this point, uh, but you know, um, he did all those books not simply because he was interested in writing a lot of things. He was so deeply involved in his work. He once said to Julia, and while he was studying, he said she had to call me back from the 18th century. He was deeply involved in it. And you know, I, I once asked him, I said, you know, Ralph, and maybe I was irritated by what I read in the New York Times that day about Antonin Scalia and his fellow conservatives on the Supreme Court. I said, Scalia and those figures on the Supreme Court and the people in the Federal Society keep saying that we should um, only base our judgments on the basis of the original intent of the Constitution. But you were an editor of the Madison and Franklin papers. You did the Madison book. You've written all these other things. You actually know something about original intent. What do you think of though, this view? And he said, well, he smiled. He said, uh, he thinks oftentimes they just reached back to find out what they thought some of those people said so they could justify their own political positions based on their ideology today. Ralph was the real scholar. But you know, I think it's heretical, but as great a scholar as he was, I think he was a greater teacher. Ralph was a teacher at Syracuse. He didn't teach only at Syracuse. That is, he traveled some from time to time. For example, he was a Fulbright professor in Japan at Suda College and at two other institutions, two of them women's institutions exclusively. He enjoyed his experience there. And when he was finished, he arranged to have a chain of remarkable graduates of these colleges come to Syracuse as graduate students. Many of them lived in his home. They studied with him in American history and American studies. And there were 12 of them across 15 years. A couple of them are here today because they became close friends of Ralph and Julia who visited them again in Japan and they would come back here. 
one of them, Professor Masako Ino, will be speaking to us later. Masako, of course, has had a remarkable career. She was uh, much honored because she's an authority on Japanese-American and Japanese-Canadian relations, and she is herself a former president of Suda. Uh, but Ralph didn't only go to Japan. Ralph taught at universities in Great Britain, in the Netherlands, in New Zealand, and Ralph and Julia lived there. Later, he lectured in India, he lectured in South Korea, he lectured in China, he lectured all over Eastern Europe, he lectured all over the world, really. He could go almost anywhere and all over America, but he always wanted to come back here because this was where, really, he wanted to teach at Syracuse and at Maxwell. And his teaching was at the center of his life. He believed, as most of us do, that teaching is not a vocation, it's a calling. I once asked him, uh, what is it that you expect to do in the classroom? What, what do you want to do there? He said, what I want to do is to foster the shaping of strong, individual, rational thinkers. He wasn't an ideologist. He didn't um, want to tell people um, what to think. He said, there are no right answers. There are only right questions. And he and his students oftentimes grapple with the really big questions. What is the nature of man? What is the nature of justice? What are the principles of government? Later, when I was called by that writer after the case award, one of his outstanding students, Jim Norton, sitting some out here somewhere back to celebrate Ralph, as the rest of us have, coming in from Ohio this morning, Jim was called by the same writer and asked what it was like to be in his classroom. And as I recall, Jim said something like, um, Ralph Ketchum didn't teach us what to think. He taught us how to think. And he did it so artfully that we ended up thinking that we had accomplished all that ourselves. <laughs> Ralph truly was a brilliant seminar teacher. He was a great listener. And because he carried his erudition so lightly, it made him one of the, the leading seminar leaders of, of, of all time. He wasn't an ideologist, but he did have one particular passion, and that passion was for citizenship. He was concerned about what one of his colleagues once called the office of the citizen, and he was concerned that Americans weren't taking their responsibilities as citizens seriously enough. He, he would say, borrowing from his friend James Madison, talking about interest groups, he would say, of course there'll always be factions, but we shouldn't celebrate that. Citizens should not only be concerned with what's good for them, what's good for number one, what's good for their own faction, they should be concerned with what's good for the larger polity. And I think he was sad in this particular year, when in the White House and in too many offices on Capitol Hill, and too many suites of lobbyists on K Street, you find people concerned only with themselves. Ralph felt that Americans should not be considered taxpayers or consumers or workers or entrepreneurs. They should be considered citizens with all the rights and responsibilities thereunto pertaining. You call him an idealist, but that was his vision. And here at Syracuse, his bread and butter course, his central course, was called Foundations of American Political Thought, a two-semester sequence of courses which he taught year after year. He said it's good to teach a thing a year after year. That's how when you really get to know the material and you can shape it that way. And he had a different version of it for the graduate students, Foundations of American Thought. He would teach it as an emeritus. He wanted to teach it one more year this fall. He would have been 90. He didn't quite make that. But he did have great students. And he not only taught these courses, he also taught that course that he spun off from the old SIT-10 program, Issues in American Democracy. And those of us who taught in it really loved doing it. I loved doing it because he was there. But there, he also chose some of the great lecturers at Syracuse University in that moment. Roger Sharp was in that course. He's out there somewhere. Bob McClure was there. 
He couldn't make it today because he's overseas with his wife. Linda Fowler was there, and there were so many others. Linda had left Syracuse. She was a political science professor when she was offered to be the position of being a Rockefeller professor at Dartmouth and head of the Rockefeller Center. Linda called me two days ago. She was sorry she couldn't. She had just come back from overseas. She wanted to be here because she said Ralph was a role model for her as a junior faculty, and he was a mentor. But she also talked about how wonderful it was to be in Public Affairs 320, what fun it was to teach him. And she said, you know, I tried to institute a course like that at Dartmouth, and I couldn't do it. And the reason I couldn't do it is because Ralph wasn't here. She said only Ralph could do it. Academics are a thin-screened bunch, and you know that when it comes to teaching their own courses, most of us want to make sure it's the reading list and the, and, and the curriculum that we want. Now, this was a voluntary thing. Nobody was asked to do this. She was trying to, he was trying to recruit people from across campus to be in it. And it's hard to do, but Ralph, with his easy demeanor, with his uh, almost self-deprecatory approach to the thing, and with everybody knowing what a great reputation he had and what a wonderful person he had, we would listen to Ralph. Ralph was the only person who could herd those academic cats. This, um, this was a great and successful course. He had many students, many great students, many students who would have distinguished careers after they left our classrooms. One of his undergraduate students is going to be speaking shortly, and that's Howard Mansfield, who's come up here with his wife, uh, Cy Montgomery, also a former student of Ralph's, I think. And uh, both of them, both of them, well, I think Howard, the last count, I think, had published 10 books, and Cy, 11 or 12. Uh, Howard's work is uh, on a wide variety of subjects, and he's published in a lot of other venues as well. I would think the best way to characterize it maybe is as a cultural historian, maybe he'll correct me, and his work has been widely reviewed and honored. Howard will be with us, and then he had great graduate students too, because he taught that seminar in American Studies, just like he had been once taught by Stuart Brown, and he produced some terrific graduate students. One of them here, Sherry McGill, is going to be talking to us a little bit later. Sherry taught American studies and American history after she left and then went down to, to um, Florida and became head of a very important foundation. And like Howard, has been awarded honorary degrees. She'll be telling us a little bit about what it was like to be a graduate student of Ralph Ketchum's. Ralph was um, a terrific person. And he, um, he was an outstanding teacher and scholar, but he was no self-enclosed academic. He didn't live some kind of normal life, normal enclosed, solitary life, got only pleasure out of writing or emerging from his place to teach. He had a wide circle of friends, some of them from all the international experiences he had teaching around the world, but also some of them well, there was this, the, the, the group in Silver Bay. Silver Bay was so important to Ralph and Julia. And they have a house there. And year after year, decade after decade, they have gone there in the summer. They love Silver Bay, and they have a wide, warm community of friends in Silver Bay. And their son, Ben, and their daughter, Laura Lee, grew up in the summer in Silver Bay and learned to love it. And so have their four grandchildren. And when Laura Lee and her husband Tom purchased a house right next to Ralph and Julia's and created a kind of Ketchum compound, I guess you would call it, it was one of the great signal pleasures and thrills of Ralph's last couple of years. But in Syracuse, they had another community, a warm community of nurturing people who they were very close to then and for years before and still today. And that was the Rafa religious community. And some members of Rafa will be with us to sing our benediction near the end of our session today. Ralph touched so many people. My sons knew him all their lives, of course, and when they were older, when they had gone to college and graduate school, they read his books 
And when he died, they were saddened. And then when they knew about this ceremony, Matt and Steve called me up together. And they said, um, Ralph was a polymath. He could do everything. You must say, tell them about Russia. So near the end of this, I guess I should tell them about Russia. And what he was talking about was that in the 1990s, our friend Joe Julian, who's somewhere out here, had created the Eastern European Center on Democracy and Governance. And it was, he located it in Budapest. It was a noble idea. The Cold War was over. The Iron Curtain was down. And now there were large numbers of social studies teachers in Eastern Europe and in Russia itself who were desperate to teach modern history and teach now for the first time about democratic citizenship. And they wanted teaching materials. And they wanted help shaping lectures about that. And so I found myself with Ralph and Julia and Joe and his wife, Marjorie. And Marge is a terrific teacher. The five of us in Budapest, and then we went, we were there for a couple of, three summers, three summers, I think. And then we were, one summer, we were in Nizhny Novgorod in the old, the new Russia. Uh, and the students were outstanding, but they also wanted a vacation after the first week of seminar. It was going to be two weeks. So we somehow had gotten access to an old young pioneers camp, kind of the Soviet Boy Scouts, which was down on the Black Sea at Anapa, right near Novorossiysk, a long way away. The last good beachfront property then in Russia, I guess. So we flew down there, and, uh, and it was a beat up old place with a big statue of Lenin. But the cabins we were supposed to stay in were, hadn't been used in years. And mine had a ripped up screen door and a non-functioning toilet. And I was, my cabin was right next to Ralph's and Julia's. And you know, I'm not terribly handy. But I had room with Ralph, and I had visited him in Silver Bay. And I knew that he had skills I didn't have. So I said to Ralph, Ralph, what, what do you think? Now, I always overpack and have too much. I have this big suitcase. And Ralph moves lightly. And he's got this little suitcase. He's got this little suitcase. So he goes over to his little suitcase. And he says, wait a minute, he says. And he brings out of this little suitcase these tools. And, and he takes the tools, and he goes into the cabin. And 15 minutes later, he fixes a toilet, which hasn't worked in 10 years or five years. Whatever. Oh my God, Ralph, I am so pleased. Thank you, I'll be able to stay here. Don't worry, I'll deal with the insects. He says, now wait a minute, he said. He goes back to the little suitcase, goes into it, and he brings out screening and nails. And he fixes the screen door. Ralph, as the guy said, could do anything. Ralph could do anything, but the thing he did best in his professional life was to be a scholar and a teacher. And you know in academia, to get tenure, to get promotion, to get the prizes in academic life as you move forward in your career, it's what you do in scholarship and teaching. And all Ralph did was to publish 12 books, and the James Madison biography was nominated for the National Book Award as a finalist. There are very, very few academic historians who've ever had that honor, very few academics anywhere. And all he did as a teacher is to win most of the teaching awards around here and at other schools. And then in 1987, the Center for the Advancement and Support of Education in America named him the College Teacher of the Year. There were 400 nominees from schools and colleges around the country, and Ralph was the winner. Um, it was a signal honor. Uh, I've been on the faculty here for many, many, many years. But I can tell you, I know of no one across my long career at Syracuse. No one in Maxwell, no one in the Arts and Sciences College, no one at the university who has ever achieved significant accomplishments like Ralph has done, both in teaching and in scholarship, and had them recognized by such prestigious national institutions. Ralph was, in fact, an academic giant. He was an academic giant, and I sometimes wondered, looking around at my, do you realize 
the person who's, who's in our presence here, what a remarkable person, guy this is. But the answer, of course, is that it was Ralph's persona. It was his unassuming um, character. It was almost self-denigrating presentation of self that did it. At the Rafa community, there was a memorial service after Ralph died a couple of months ago. And one of the younger members of the community said, when I was a child, a very young kid, I asked Ralph Ketchum a question about history and he treated me just like I was an adult. He took me so seriously and we went through it and there was a kind of a just dialogue. And then finally I understood the answer. And you know what? I didn't realize until much later that he was a world famous scholar. Of course she didn't. Ralph didn't carry himself that way. He was not impressed by himself. And that way he was different than some academic stars. Not all academic stars are self-obsessed or arrogant, but a few are, you know. When I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago, they said of the historians there, they used to walk through the halls like battleships saluting each other. And John Kenneth Galbraith once said about his institution, using the sexist language of his moment in history, that the faculty at Harvard could be divided into two groups. There were the second men, and there were the millisecond men, that being the absolute maximum period of time that these individuals could tolerate talking or hearing about someone other than themselves. <laughs> that was exactly what Ralph Ketchum was not. Ralph Ketchum was an academic giant, but he was a gentle, modest giant. And I believe that's one of the reasons why he was so loved by so many, and one of the reasons why he was such a magnificent teacher. Those of us who are lucky enough, fortunate enough, to have been his students, to have been his colleagues, to have been his friends, are going to remember him always and miss him always. But how much richer has been our life for having known him. And now it's time to hear from some of Ralph's friends who met him first as students in their classes. And the first will be Professor Mosco Eno. Good afternoon. <clears throat> well, it is my great honor and privilege to be here with you to be part of this memorial service for Dr. Ralph L. Ketchum. Although I still find it very difficult to believe that he's not here with us. In April 2015, we those Japanese scholars and former students who have known Dr. Ketchum and Mrs. Ketchum for a long time decided to invite them to Japan to celebrate the 50th anniversary of their first visit to Japan. It was in 1965 that they came to teach in Japan for the first time. Dr. Ketchum was a Fulbright visiting scholar at the time teaching at three universities in Tokyo, Tokyo University, Japan Women's University, and Tsuda College, where I was an undergraduate student. And these universities had just started American studies programs with the general support given by the US government. And Dr. Ketchum, who was 37 years old at the time, was a very important part of developing these uh, new American studies programs. And since then, he returned to Japan, where he had many friends, to give talks several times, including his 50th anniversary visit in 2015. And we are very proud that such a distinguished scholar, as Dr. Ketchum taught, at our universities in Japan. 
At the same time, to my eye, he was a great, great educator who was warm, understanding, and had a profound impact on those around him. He always showed sincere passion to help those who needed it, even in a field not his own. His contribution to the education of young people in Japan and around the world is immeasurable. One of the greatest contributions that Dr. Ketchum and Mrs. Ketchum made to the education of young people in Japan, which we deeply appreciate, is that they established a scholarship for Japanese students to study at the Graduate School of Syracuse University. They also generously offered the students who were chosen from the women's universities where Dr. Ketchum taught in 1965 to stay at their home in Syracuse. The scholarship lasted for 10 years and about 10 graduates of these universities benefited from this wonderful program that the Ketchums established. And this scholarship produced many professors and professionals in Japan who have been contributing to the education of younger generation. And these 10 former students called themselves the Ketchum uh, proudly call themselves Ketchum girls even now. And I was fortunate enough to be one of those 10 Ketchum girls. And the scholarship program enabled me to study at the Graduate School of Syracuse University between 1966 and 1969. The Ketchums accepted me into their home like a member of the family. And I truly enjoyed being with them and their babies, Ben and Laura Lee. When they traveled to such places as Georgia, New York, and Washington, D.C., they generously took me with them in their car, with Dr. Ketchum driving and explaining all the histories of those places. And living in the Ketchum's home, or simply being with them, was very inspiring for me. Each day, I learned a great deal from them. All priceless experiences and fond memories I will forever cherish. And I still remember that at the breakfast table, Dr. Ketchum often made his own peanut butter and jelly sandwiches to take to work. And Mrs. Ketchum used to say, when I'm interviewed by the press and asked, what made this world famous great philosopher? I will immediately respond to them by saying peanut butter and jelly sandwiches there. <laughs> As I had, well, the, the peanut butter and jelly sandwich itself was a new experience for me. It's very American. No, so I had never seen any Japanese men around me, including my own brother, making his own lunch. It was really a great opportunity to learn about the American way of life. And looking back on my days there, I truly think that everything, including my future professional path, started there at the Ketchum's home. Even without saying it, they showed me the way I could take. And I cannot thank them enough. Dr. Ketchum's role as an educator for me was not limited to academic studies and research, nor only to the period when I was a student at Syracuse. He always gave me many learning opportunities, which I so much valued and appreciated. In 2013, when I was a visiting scholar at Bryn Mawr College in Philadelphia, he invited me to participate as one of the judges in the Virginia State Championship Contest, We the People, the Citizen and the Constitution, hosted, hosted by the Center for the Constitution at James Madison's Montpelier. What an impressive learning experience for me, a retired professor. I could clearly see that high school students from various parts of the United States striving to become champions, 
seriously studied and learned about the Constitution, democracy, citizenship, and the way to train themselves in order to have a say in politics. One more illustration for his great impact on me is his world view, or his idea of global communication and international discourse. He once told me the following ex episode. When he came to Japan in 1965 to teach Japanese students about the United States, his view on various matters was so broadened that he even felt that his new career started there and then. Teaching in a foreign country gave him new perspectives or new angles to deal with his own research. Teaching is learning, he said, and we in various countries learn together. I completely share his idea and strongly believe that such a way of thinking is the essence of educating young people to be global citizens. Dr. Ketchum, all your friends and former students of yours in Japan are deeply saddened by the fact that we cannot listen to your talks, discuss things with you, and learn from you, or laugh with you anymore. We certainly miss you, but we promise we will not forget what we have learned from you. We will follow your path, sharing what you have learned from you to help others by learning together. Your long-lasting long influence will be passed down to the next generation. And we are all forever grateful to you for your generosity and all that you have taught us. And Mrs. Ketchum, in whatever ways possible, we share in your loss, being grateful to, for, for the virtues that both of you have shared with us. Thank you. Uh, my name is Howard Mansfield. I'm just, I was an undergraduate student, one, of, one in a very long line of undergraduate students. L let me tell you a story about one visit to Silver Bay uh, about seven years ago. It was always so sweet to arrive at the Ketchum small yellow cottage, hidden as it was from the road, sheltered by the tall trees in the hill behind and the brook out front. The first welcoming sign was the old mailbox, leaning back on a rough post, steadied with the rope, and then the porch with the swing at one end, two white wooden screen doors with their gingerbread trim, Adirondack chairs sitting out front to one side, where we'd usually end up talking. And on the other side was the swing, which hung very high in a tree. Their son, Ben, had to vise a cantilevered and turnbuckled support for the swing. This was not your usual backyard engineering. <laughs> I remember Dr. Ketchum. He was never Ralph to us. I remember him pushing his granddaughter, Kaylee, in that swing when she was about eight years old. And Kaylee and her niece, sitting side by side on the porch swing, reading, sharing an iPod, each with one earbud. <laughs> The Ketchums treated your arrival as if this is what they've been waiting for all summer. <laughs> Julia greeted you with her smile and that touch of Georgia in her voice and just the way she shades certain words. And there was Dr. Ketchum with his low key, perfect cadence and the sureness of detail that made him spellbinding. On this visit, we were going sailing. I visited quite a few times, I expected this. A visit was usually a marathon of canoeing out to the boat, sailing and swimming afterwards, and of course, hauling boat gear. 
I remember that Julia, with her steady, slow stroke, could have swum right up the lake and on into Canada. Visits often began with Dr. Ketchum's porch side divining of the winds on the lake, which he knew perfectly after all those summers. So there was this moment when the household was in motion getting ready to go sailing, grandchildren and children looking for bathing suits, towels, sneakers, Julia making sandwiches, Dr. Ketchum making toast. He loved toast. <laughs> I was making myself useful by reading that day's New York Times. <laughs> this gray cat walks in. Dr. Ketchum greets the cat, calls him Edward. Why is this cat called Edward, I asked him. I mean, that's a rather formal name for a cat, Edward. Uh, but the way the cat walked across the room, he was no Eddie. He's named for Edward Coles, he told me. Coles was Madison's private secretary. <laughs> After Coles came into his considerable inheritance in 1808, he freed his 17 slaves. He had to leave his native Virginia to do it. This was not an easy thing. Jefferson argued against it. Cole set them up on a farm of their own in Illinois, giving each family 160 acres to start their free life. Coles went on to be Illinois' second governor. He urged Madison to free his slaves in his will. When Lincoln was on his way to be inaugurated, he stopped to see Coles, now an old man, to honor him for freeing his slaves. It was a model of how it should be done. Lincoln, said Dr. Ketchum, was deeply moved by Coles. Imagine that train trip, he said. Lincoln stopping along the way to reassure the country, knowing what awaited. There it was, a compact story with a deep view. Back to Madison, forward to Lincoln in the Civil War. Ralph Ketchum was a natural teacher. I could have left right then and considered it a great visit, left and gone back to New Hampshire. Learning from Dr. Ketchum was just like that one moment. His lectures cut through the clutter, keep, kept bringing you back to the essential ideas and documents. He had a great gift for explaining, in just a few sentences, the heart of the matter. He never wavered or got waylaid by an academic fashion. He never digressed. He wasn't showy or dramatic. He wasn't a character. He had character. He was a leader. He assumed your intelligence and your interest. In the seminar reading group of about five or six, he waited for us, nudged us, waited some more, let us ride our hobby horses, as he once termed our pet opinions, and at last would point out what we'd failed to see, just why we were reading that book and what it had to do with the previous book. He never called out anyone or gave one of those class-wide scoldings. When are you people going to learn to read, hmm? But until he had spoken, it was as if we had read the book in the dark. Oh, I remember thinking more than once, I completely missed that. He did this in such a way that it seems as if we had found the answer ourselves. He quote bits of what each of us had said, giving us credit where none was due. But with his editing, our comments made sense. We were much smarter in his retelling. He was a gentle guide even when he should have just thumped the book on our skulls and sent us on our way to reread the assignment. Sometimes we met at the Ketchum's house to discuss our reading. I have to say that he served us the worst beer ever. Peel's Real Draft in cans. It was like drinking liquid aluminum. <laughs> the Peel's was a Methodist plot to limit drinking. I don't think anyone ever finished a can. <laughs> but the six of us American Studies students, we'd never even think of putting together $1.29 to buy a six of Jenny Cream Ale. I was accidentally his student, recruited for the American Studies program in the offices of the Daily Orange on deadline as I sat with Jim Naughton at an old royal typewriter, a gray battleship of a machine with a sound and a feel I still miss. One of us typing, the other pacing around, crumbling up rejected drafts to shoot into the trash as we tried to come up with the day's editorial. We were assistant editorial editors, late freshman year in 1976. When the editorial editor arrived, not to write anything, no, that made too much sense, but to read us an entire lecture out of his notebook. 
I think from Dr. Ketchum's intellectual history class, and to tell us that we had to be American study students, and also to tell us that we didn't know anything. He knew things. He wore a beret, smoked stinky French cigarettes. We were just freshmen. What did we know? So independently, we went to see Dr. Ketchum in his office at the end of the hall in Maxwell. He had on his desk the oldest telephone I'd ever seen outside a museum. <laughs> a big black dial phone that was the ur phone, the dictionary illustration of a phone. Those old phones and typewriters gave words weight. He asked me why I wanted to study American culture. I don't recall my answer, but I remember the way he would lean back in his chair and tilt his head a bit, taking your measure. <laughs> maybe I quoted a bit of the Tocqueville I'd never read. Or maybe I quoted the recent Russell Baker column which said that Tocqueville's Democracy in America was the most quoted, least read book in America. Or maybe I never even read that Russell Baker column I was talking about. Whatever I said, I'm just glad there were no tapes. Poor Dr. Katchen may have been thinking, I've got to talk to the admissions office. Where are they getting these 18-year-olds? But he took us in. No one came to Syracuse for the American Studies program. We were a very small band of dissenters from the big university, the multiversity that Chancellor Tolley had built long ago. We had stumbled into the Maxwell School and all these great professors, Doc Bennett, Professors McClure, and Sawyer, and so many others. With his patience and kindness, he kept us slogging through the endless pages of Puritan writings, those jolly fundamentalists, and the acres of prose from the lesser transcendentalists, who were more scolding than transcendent. Having lived in New England for 30 years, I can tell you that scolding is the region's great art form. Dr. Ketchum had equanimity. As I recall, he never used that word. He demonstrated it. We were, as a group, a little high-strung in a rush to go to the barricades if we could find them. I do remember him talking about the middle way. It was the Confucian idea of interdependence that he stressed as a way to take us beyond the fortress of an American individualism. Equanimity, the middle way, a strong belief in the founders and the Constitution, his patience with his students. You'll never win the soundbite wars advocating for the middle way. It's just not what's shouted on cable news or on Twitter. And there's one other essential thing you never lost sight of, which Doc Bennett was talking about, the full name of the Maxwell School of Citizenship. In recent years, he was obsessed, as Julia said, with finding out why the Maxwell School had forsaken the teaching of citizenship. He had read the back issues of a leading poli-sci review starting in 1903. He saw that the rise of Darwinism had led political scientists to try and describe what is, rather than to prescribe what should be. It was a moral, neutral, scientific approach. But no one is talking about the public good, he said. And Julia said, they look at him as if they had never heard the phrase. On those visits, after a swim and lunch and the offer of a beer, which I would politely decline, he turned that question on me. As I traveled around, he asked, reporting and writing books, did I meet people who had a sense of citizenship, who were looking out for the public good? Was that public spirit rising or failing? Tough questions. Ralph Ketchum never stopped asking the tough questions and asking that you do the same. One more scene from Silver Bay. We were motoring up the lake to go to a good cove for a swim. Dr. Ketchum gave the tiller to their 14-year-old niece. He taught her to guide the boat around the various navigation marks and to hold it steady. She woggled the boat, nosing us here and there. He gave her a lot of room to make mistakes. His instruction was almost invisible as he made what seemed to be the smallest comments to make her, to keep her on course. Gentle corrections. Just a bit of a teaching metaphor there. Ralph Ketchum was important not only for what he taught, but how he taught. He transformed my education. I owe him, but that's misleading. It implies that I can pay him back, and I never can. Thank you.
in the seed and apple tree, in cocoons a hidden promise, butterflies will soon be free. In the coldest winter, there's a spring that waits to be unrevealed until it's Satan, something God alone can see. There's a song in every silence, seeking word and melody. There's a dawn. Bringing hope to you and me from the past will come the future. What it holds a mystery unrevealed until it sees and something God alone can see. Good afternoon to Julia and Ben and Laura Lee. I offer my deepest condolences and to Ralph Ketchum's extended family, friends, and students. I share your sadness knowing that Ralph's passing means that we have lost someone who by his very nature embodied the essence of this place. Someone we could point to and say, that's what we mean when we talk about citizenship and public purpose. I'm deeply honored to offer some brief remarks about Ralph Ketchum, a scholar, scholar, and a teacher's teacher. I formally studied with Professor Ketchum from fall 1978 until my graduation in 1984. He not only encouraged me, he supported me, taught me, helped me receive a tuition scholarship, gave me a teaching assistantship, let me share his office, directed my dissertation, and gave me a critical pep talk when I told him that I had failed two of five doctoral comprehensive exams, both, both in American literature, not political theory, delaying my dissertation by a semester. I had no idea what he might say, but he was absolutely true to form. I've taught here many years, he said, and I've seen this a few times. Do what they ask you to do, retake the exams, and get on with your life. No judgment, not one question about how I might have screwed up. Absolute confidence in me. After I graduated from here and took a job at a small college, he answered my call when I needed a scholar with impeccable credentials and a humble spirit to moderate a week-long seminar for small college professors on the topic of the liberal arts and American citizenship. He never disappointed. Over the years, we were not in close touch, but he always seemed to know where I was and what I was doing. And last year, I had the great good fortune of spending a day with Ralph and Julia when they vacationed with family in Florida. We talked about the two presidential candidates, the upcoming election and the restoration of James Madison's Montpelier. Forty years earlier, two young professors and a college friend from my undergraduate days, totally and completely independent of one another, 
recommended I come to Syracuse to study with Ralph Ketchum. I had dropped out of an American Studies doctoral program, and these three, all Ketchum students, thought I would strive, thrive under his tutelage. How well I remember our first conversation. I traveled to Syracuse from Tuscaloosa in April 1978. Snow flurries, if you can believe it, were still flying, so I had deep and grave doubts about this place. But I came here for the sole purpose of meeting Professor Ketchum, who was gracious enough to give this young 26-year-old Southern woman an hour of his time on a Friday afternoon. He sat in his office behind that desk, yes, with his head leaned slightly to one side and his eyes clearly focused on me, and he asked, what are you reading? in this gentle, kind, familiar voice as if he was genuinely interested, as if he really wanted to know. Well, I'm reading this skinny little book by Lewis Thomas called The Lives of a Cell. So am I. That was it. This icon was reading the same book I was reading. So we talked about mitochondriae, human nature, and the cooperative spirit, and it was so crystal clear to me that I would somehow, by hook or by crook, and no matter how much I suffered in winter, come here. If you did not have the great good fortune to be Professor Ketchum's student, attend his undergraduate lectures, sit in his graduate seminars, read his critique of your papers, and discuss how you might improve your writing, you missed something really special. He never once, in all the years I studied with him and knew him, not one time did he ever make me feel intellectually inferior. He saw me simply as a student who wanted to learn. He always made me feel as if he was learning alongside me, rather than preaching or teaching or pontificating. He had this gift, and when I taught, I tried hard to emulate him. And he had this uncanny, quiet confidence in his students. At least I felt it. In a big moment in my life, defense of my doctoral dissertation proposal, Ketchum, who was chairing the meeting, sat at one end of the table with me at the other end. This is a huge moment, right? This is when someone else tells you whether or not you get to proceed or start over. I was super nervous. In fact, before this two-hour inquisition ended, I suffered a bad nosebleed and had to leave the room. But at the beginning, Professor Ketchum asked the first question, and then, because this was 12 o'clock noon, proceeded to construct a sandwich. I do not mean eat lunch. I mean he literally took pieces, two pieces of bread from a brown paper bag, some lunch meat, and a whole red tomato, and proceeded to slice it and layer his sandwich together. And then he ate it all while I sat at the other end of the table being grilled by his peers. He never asked another question, just the one followed by lunch. <laughs> Ralph Ketchum was a great presence in my life across four decades now, and his influence runs deep. I will miss him. But I am forever grateful that I can call myself one of Professor Ketchum's students. We can, anytime we wish, hear his voice when we read his books, the latest of which is almost like sitting in his classroom. It's all there, Plato, Aristotle, Franklin, Madison, Jefferson, and yes, Hamilton, Martin Luther King Jr. and Toni Morrison, Dewey and Lippmann and Joe Tussman our beloved professor's last epistle to us, his last plea, his concern about civic virtue and the dangers of over-specialization, his humble yet scholarly reminder that democratic culture demands our care. We have this moral responsibility, this responsibility that Ralph Ketchum felt so very deeply, this responsibility that all we hold in common setting aside our narrow self-interest in pursuit of a much greater, larger public purpose. I can hear him and I can see him now asking leading questions so that we, his students, discover this lesson for ourselves. Thank you, Ralph Ketchum.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Benjamin Ketchum, uh, Ralph's son. And uh, on behalf of the family, the families, I'd like to thank everyone for being here. Thank you for all the kind words and the beautiful music, uh, Brad and Marcy, and um, our, our organist, Joseph Downing, real nice at the beginning. I really like that Cesar Franck piece, especially. That's a personal favorite. Um, in all these ways, we, uh, we celebrate uh, dad's presence and influence on our lives here uh, more than really uh, bemoan his loss, although it is a, a hard loss to accept. Um, when I say uh, family, uh, Ralph um, was at the center of a, a family tree which uh, over the years has, has grown uh, considerably. So I'd like to call out the names, some of the names of all the, the different threads of family that he joined together. Of course, Ketchum and Stillwell. We also have Jones, Murphy, Johannin, McGrath, Gibbons, Putnam, Adsit, Bidwell, Hinkhaus, Hitchcock, Wenzel, and perhaps many others that I, I forget, but uh, we, uh, we all are now charged to carry forward without dad in our lives. Um, but I think we feel a, a responsibility, there's, there's a charge that he's, he's set a, a challenge for us to, to carry on. And uh, of course he could enunciate it much better than I ever could, but I, I view it as uh, we're, we're really charged to, um, to realize the American dream. Uh, and that I think my dad saw as more than just uh, a dream of uh, personal self-interest and material prosperity. Many countries have dreams like that. Uh, and more even than individual liberty, uh, although we share that with fewer countries, but many do have that dream. But um, really, I think the American dream and the charge that Ralph would, would wish to, uh, to leave us with is to learn to cooperate and coexist, help each other uh, think to a larger, larger goal than, than just the personal. Um, he taught that explicitly in his teaching and also just by the example that he set to, to all of us. And we'll, we'll carry that with us forward and, and try to live up to that challenge. Uh, following this um, Rafa community, Ralph's uh, church group is going to... Um, provide a singing benediction. Uh, the verse will be repeated three times, and uh, the first time we think of it as for Ralph, second time will be for our nation and its leaders who surely need some help at this time. And uh, the third time will be for the earth and all of her beings and all of, all of life. Uh, so that's to come and we ask that everybody stand for that benediction uh, after that there will be a reception which I'm told is going to be in the Dr. Paul and Natalie Strasser legacy room so anyone who knows where that is be sure to go to the reception I'm sure it'll be good thank you